V.V. Blackshear, Clara Carter, and I have been asked to share with you something about the Infants and Children's Sanitarium in Saluda, which was established by our grandparents, Lassane and Nettie Haynes-Smith, 104 years ago. But to give credit where credit is due, my parents, Jake and Nettie Owings, prepared most of these comments for a talk they gave in Tryon in the late 1980s. We Smith cousins weren't even around for most of the years that the Infants and Children's Sanitarium was in existence. I also want to thank Bob Bailey and my husband George for the hours they spent digitalizing, is that the word? The pictures that you're going to see on the screen. Every institution is the shadow or extension of a personality. In the case of the Infants and Children's Sanitarium, there were two. We'll begin with Daniel Lassane Smith, who was born July 28, 1877. He was of English and French Huguenot ancestry. He always said, I was born in Hellhole Swamp and reared on Hungry Neck. Geographically, that translates to Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. <laughs> He attended Porter Military Academy and entered the first class at Clemson College, but he did not graduate. Late in his senior year, he was officer of the day during the night when someone stole a turkey from the commissary. After a hasty investigation, he was declared the culprit and shipped home. When he got home, he found a telegram from the college inviting him to come back. However, he couldn't return because he didn't have train fare. In 1927, a Clemson alumnus on his deathbed admitted that he had stolen the turkey. <laughs> As a result, Dr. Smith was brought back to the campus and awarded his diploma. In spite of this incident, he was always a strong supporter of Clemson. Go Tigers! <laughs> Ambitious, though poor, Lassane applied to the South Carolina Medical College in Charleston and was accepted. But medical school had to wait until he had some funds. His entire life, and certainly my cousin's and mine, was directly influenced by his first job, which was teaching at Hain Academy in Fort Mott, South Carolina. In return for tutoring the Haines' young son, William, Lassane was offered free room and board in the Hain household. There, the Haines' second daughter, Amy, and Lassane fell in love. For Lassane, the years of waiting for marriage was an interminable period of study interspersed with summer jobs, such as motorman on the streetcar in Charleston and laborer in a fertilizer plant, where he learned that pulverized coal was added as the inert filter because farmers had the false notion that blacker fertilizer meant a more potent product. <laughs> Once he was paid to accompany a mental patient to the state hospital in Columbia. During the train ride, the patient became violent and attempted to jump out of the window. The broken glass cut Lassane's nose, leaving a very noticeable scar for the rest of his life. In 1904, soon after graduating from medical school, he married Amy Hain. In quick succession, they had four children, Lassane Jr., Kit, Pache, and Nettie. He began general practice in the upper part of South Carolina until he settled permanently in Spartanburg in 1909. Tragedy struck in 1911. Amy died of pneumonia, leaving him with three small boys and an infant son, a girl. Lassane had lost the love of his life. What was a physician father with four small children to do? Who would come to the rescue? Let's now turn to the second personality that affected the Infants and Children's Sanitarium, Nettie Hain. She was born March 13, 1869, just after the Civil War, the eldest daughter of John Kit Hain, a resident of the rural hamlet in Middle South Carolina named Fort Mott. Nettie was a spinster and was considered to be sickly, suffering in the summer months from the oppressive heat. Her father knew a Colonel Sloan of Charleston, who had recently built a summer home in Saluda for his bride. This is now Clara's home. 
conversation between the two men led to an invitation for Mr. Hain to visit the Sloans in Saluda while he looked for a piece of property. In fact, Mr. Hain brought property adjoining the Sloans and gave it to his daughter, Nettie. Nettie, now the owner of a piece of mountain property and rejuvenated by the prospect of a summer home, began plans for a two-story house. In the difficult times after the Civil War, money was hard to obtain. Nettie, however, was fortunate in having a nest egg, which she carefully tended her entire life. Her grandfather, Dr. Daniel Jenkins Townsend, a planter of long staple cotton on Watermalaw Island, had the foresight during the war to hide 50 bales in the swamp. After the war, cotton was in much demand, selling for an astronomical price, more than a dollar a pound. <laughs> Dr. Townsend gave his, this money to his grandchildren. Nettie now had the funds to build Bonaire, which belongs to Vivi. With Amy's sudden death, Nettie stepped in, taking charge of the children. Practicality and devotion, if not love, ended the family crisis. Lassane and Nettie courted and were married in 1912. I was often told by my mother that Nettie couldn't stand the idea of her sister's children having a stepmother, so she married their father. <laughs> Dr. Smith's general practice, though growing, was not completely satisfying. He became alarmed at the high mortality rate of small children. With our sanitary conditions today, it is difficult for us to think of conditions that in the early 1900s were typical of thousands of families. No electricity, no screening, no refrigeration, no pasteurized milk, no chlorinated water, and certainly no air conditioning. If a child lived through its second year, he or she had a good chance to reach adulthood. Thus, Dr. Smith decided he wanted to be a pediatrician. Consequently, he went to New York for a postgraduate course and then to Harvard Medical School. He became one of the first pediatricians in the South. Whether general practitioner or pediatrician, the basic problem was the same. Families everywhere in the South dreaded the summer months the deadly time for children. That was the season when flies, dirty milk, and contaminated water produced diarrhea and dysentery with their deadly dehydration. Keep in mind there were no sulfur drugs, no penicillin, no antibiotics. What could a physician do to add to his methods of cure? Dr. Smith reasoned he could use climate, the cool summers in the mountains, because his second wife owned two houses in Saluda, he had a base from which to operate. Therefore, he decided to establish the Infants and Children's Sanitarium, open from June 1 to September 1. This was in 1914. The other nine months, he continued his practice in Spartanburg. He used Bonaire as a hospital while he and his family lived in treetops. That was his office, believe it or not, um, in the basement. Though he had only 18 patients the first summer, the venture was a medical success, for lives were saved and parents were grateful. As his reputation as a pediatrician grew, physicians throughout the state and surrounding ones referred their seriously ill children to him. Thus, he needed more space. Consequently, he bought Hillcrest, a three-story frame building and I have to say, my mother said it never looked that good. <laughs> Apparently, we never painted it. Um, it was a three-story frame building, originally built as an inn. Later, he added the two-story wing. This structure was known locally as the hospital, the building where trained nurses cared for the really ill patients. The modern amenities of Pardee, St. Luke's, and Park Ridge hospitals were definitely absent. The building was similar to the Thomas Wolfe home in Asheville, one electric bulb hanging from the ceiling of each room and no private baths. On the first floor, there was a lounge, the nurse's station, and a large treatment or operating room. Here, only minor surgery such as removal of tonsils and adenoids was performed. All the other rooms were for little patients. 
We still have several cribs which were themselves one of his methods of treatment. Clara's given one to the depot, which is located in the next room over. It's full of uh, sweatshirts. <laughs> he had wooden cribs constructed, which were narrow enough to be carried through any of the hospital's doorways. Canvas was used in place of mattresses so that the beds could be washed and sun-dried when the baby soiled the bed. Every day the babies, without clothing, were taken outside to soak up sun. Chronic diaper rash was eliminated. The final physical development of the Infants and Children's Sanitarium was determined by Dr. Smith's basic philosophy, namely that mother and child must be kept together. Only the children who needed constant nurse supervision should be kept in the hospital. So rooms in the surrounding cottages would be more comfortable and homelike. As a consequence, he bought neighboring summer cottages as they became available, and as his credit would allow. Nettie's nest egg was borrowed and repaid time and again. In its final form, the sanitarium consisted of 13 buildings on 13 acres, all on Smith Hill. And that is Jenny Haynes' house now. This first house was the kitchen to Clara's house. The next one was the kitchen to Vivi's house. And that was a World War I Red Cross building that is no longer there. It's been replaced by a much nicer house. And that is the bullpen. Uh, when single doctors came to the seminar, they were all put in, down there together. So it was, that's why it's called the bullpen. I think it should be noted here that without Nettie's two houses in Saluda and her, and her little nest egg, Dr. Smith never could have undertaken the hospital. He had no money and no securities to guarantee credit. It's hard for us today to realize that until the 1940s, physicians had a living wage but no extra money. They were part of the professional poor, like ministers and teachers. Furthermore, some of the years of operation of the sanitarium were the dep depression years, extreme years. A shocking statistic brings us to reality. In 1932, the per capita income per year in South Carolina was $157. The records in the Polk County Courthouse bear out the fact that Dr. Smith was always expanding but always seriously in debt, relying on his life, wife's limited possessions as security. She was wholeheartedly cooperative in developing their common goal. Nettie not only supported her husband financially, but was also the hostess on Smith Hill, spending time landscaping and beautifying the grounds. Moreover, she made all the curtains and pillows for the houses and did everything in her power to make things run smoothly. In addition to the hospital building, Dr. Smith erected a central dining room, copied after World War I mess halls, for staff and parents of children. Children were not allowed in the mess hall until they were 12 years old. He built a separate children's dining room where no mothers were allowed. <laughs> Nurses fed the children so that Dr. Smith knew what each one ate. There were always children sent to Saluda who had eating problems at home. I have five grandchildren who could have used his help, and maybe you do too. <laughs> Food for the children was prepared in a separate building called the Diet Kitchen, which is the basis for my sister Amy Weimer's home. This was usually staffed by Winthrop College girls who were home economics majors. It should be noted here that, he, that as he purchased the cottages, the kitchens were immediately removed. As a further means of control of the sanitarium, he closed all roads to Smith Hill except one, the one that came to the admission office, which was where he also had his office for outpatients. The first requirement was accommodations. The next was food, milk, good milk, for the babies was a necessity. Mother's milk, cow's milk, goat's milk, and substitute milk. 
In order to get quality cow's milk for the hospital, Dr. Smith persuaded Herbert Pace to establish a dairy in Saluda named Sunnyside Dairy. If mother's milk was needed, usually there was a wet nurse available in the area. Also, a woman from California, a Mrs. Belle Miller, established a goat farm, but it didn't prosper and folded after several years. But the interesting thing was she brought a famous cat with her from California because it had been in the movie Birth of a Nation. <laughs> Still, some children couldn't tolerate any kind of natural milk, but substitute milk was not being made commercially then. However, Dr. Smith found an old recipe for a substitute, which they called sunshine flour. Our understanding is that the girls in the diet kitchen placed five pounds of flour in a cloth bag, soaked it in water, and then put the bag and contents in the sunshine to dry thoroughly. The resulting hard ball, ball when scraped, produced a water-soluble powder. Somehow in the drying process, the dextrose broke down, providing a nutritious, palatable formula. Dr. Smith shared the recipe with Mead Johnson and Company, which produced it as a commercial formula. He received no remuneration for it, which never seemed to bother him, for now he had a product that his small patients needed. In addition to office staff and nurses, Dr. Smith had three or four interns from the South Carolina Medical College to help in the laboratory, x-ray room, and treatment room. They were given room and board plus $50 a month. With this, they felt richly rewarded. Due to the young men's after-hours inclination, their quarters were appropriately named Stagger Inn. <laughs> As an aside, I have to tell you that the intern's room had originally been the Smith's Chicken House in Spartanburg. <laughs> Smith Hill was a make-do operation. Currently, it continues to house two sets of bunk beds for grandsons. The same year that the Infants and Children's Sanitarium opened, Dr. Smith became involved in a similar but entirely independent institution, namely the Spartanburg Baby Hospital in Saluda. It was a charity hospital and clinic sponsored by people from Spartanburg. For most of its existence, Dr. Smith provided the medical supervision without charge. Another highly successful innovation of Dr. Smith should be mentioned. After attending a meeting of the Southern Medical Association, he and Dr. Frank Howard Richardson of Black Mountain decided that the general practitioner, who treated 90% of the children, should be trained in child care. To make the concept practical, Dr. Smith in 1920 established the Southern Pediatric Seminar on Smith Hill. It was a two-week postgraduate summer seminar in the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of the diseases of children. The faculty, composed of distinguished practitioners and medical school faculty, gave their services free. In time, the seminar erected its own lecture hall where more than 800 physicians from Texas to Virginia were instructed in the latest pediatric concepts and practices. However, that's a story of its own. The lecture hall is the basis of Mike and Lynn Cassie's home on Smith Hill. But returning to the Infant and Children's Sanitarium, the logistics of the operation were a nightmare. Dr. Smith must have spent many sleepless nights thinking of means to hire, for three summer months, a trained, congenial staff of nurses, interns, dietitians, cooks, waiters, and maids. Fortunately, the mountain location and summer vacation gave him an, an advantage. For example, Cora Foster, the head maid, came yearly from New York City. Kenneth Jeter of Saluda, head waiter, took leave of absence from Converse College. Slim, a waiter at the South Carolina School for the Deaf and Blind in Cedar Springs, where Dr. Smith was school physician, did the same. Nurses came from the Spartanburg General Hospital or Dr. Smith's staff in Spartanburg. Interns from the Medical College, dietitian and head chef from Walford College. Other help were procured locally in Spartanburg 
and salute them. And most importantly, all the family pitched in wherever they were needed, be they sisters, cousins, children, or spouses. That is Nettie on the left, uh, Sally, his sister, in the middle, and my mother <laughs> on, the, on the right. Uh, and, she, and part of her job was to entertain children. So everybody had a job. Some of Dr. Smith's treatments, which work well for him, might seem counterproductive today. I remember his using Coca-Cola for us children with upset stomachs. We loved the remedy. For certain skin diseases, he used light treatment. I can't tell you what it was, except that it involved a contraption that looked like half a metal ball with a long light bulb in it that rocked back and forth while the patient sat under it. And it worked. He also used dry ice to cure ringworm. Painful, but effective. I think he used all of them on me. <laughs> he also recommended that children go barefoot all summer. Surely that helped a family's budget. Dr. Smith, busy as he was, took time to master the art of living. He knew when to stop and how to play. Every evening in Saluda, he would take a boat ride on Lake Summit, stopping as needed at Camp Mondamin, where he was camp physician. Likewise, he liked to dance, especially square dance. Every three or four weeks, he would host a square dance on Smith Hill, primarily to keep the staff and mothers happy. His punch of grapefruit juice and alcohol was famous. <laughs> and oh, how he enjoyed taking friends to the South Carolina Low Country on fishing trips above his beloved Winyaw. Dr. Smith loved children, but he studied human nature. Consequently, he became a raconteur, as were his sons, grandson Lassane Smith and Vivi. For example, he liked to tell about Addie, a mountain girl who worked in the hospital. One day she told him she was going to marry Johnny. Dr. Smith, knowing Johnny to be idle, lazy, and irresponsible, said, why? Addie said, oh, doctor, he's so good to me, he helps me slop the paw hogs. <laughs> And Vivi has, has a few things. That we just love our family stories. Oh, my daddy, they said he was the worst little boy. I mean, he was a good man, and I just, he was wonderful. I loved him so. But he would just get in trouble, and he, he was just mischievous. And so one day, Nan, Nanette just had, said she had to just give up and, and punish him. So she put him in the closet and closed the door. And she said, now just be quiet for a little while and you'll, you'll be all right. So he made all this noise and then everything, it got quiet. And she got worried about him. So she opened the door and she said, son, are you all right? And he said, I've spit on the clothes and I've spit on the shoes and I'm sitting here waiting on more spit. <laughs> But, it, but that, we had good, funny stories in our family. We were just, we really were lucky. And to think that of all of us, 10 of us live up here now, and it's wonderful. I love every day of living next to Clara and Nettie and my sister Lassane. <laughs> The best part of the stories that we heard growing up about these uncles uh, was that they loved to tell them on themselves, and they would get so tickled after they did. They just thought it was great. And how our grandmother survived, I do not know. <laughs> Though Dr. Smith was busy at home, he had broader horizons, illustrated by the fact that he was president of the South Carolina Medical Association, established a graduate seminar at the South Carolina Medical College, and chaired the pediatric sec section of the Southern Medical Association. In all of his activities, he had the happy faculty of putting himself in the background. Lassane died on July 7, 1947, at the age of 70. 
He had hoped that his son, Dr. D. Lassane Smith, Jr., would continue the sanitarium, but that was not to be. The family closed it only a couple of years after his death. The Southern Pediatric Seminar continued on Smith Hill through 1958 when it moved to the Grove Park Inn in Asheville. The houses on Smith Hill have mo mostly stayed in the family with all the summer cottages now winterized and brought up to code. Of the Smith's 13 grandchildren, 10 of us now have homes in Saluda. Quite obviously, we siblings and cousins are grateful for the marvelous heritage left to us by Lassane, Amy, and Nettie Smith. A close friend, after visiting Saluda one year, found an article written by his cousins years after being treated by Dr. Smith. I want to share parts of it with you. She is Martha Duval Jones of Sherrall, South Carolina. And it, she titled her article, Story of a Sick Baby and Dr. Smith's Clinic in Saluda. I was born on the 3rd of November, 1936, which was election day. My father always said that was the one election in which he didn't vote. I was the first child born to Howard Elliott Duvall and Martha McInnes Duvall of Sherall. Evidently, I was sick from the start. I couldn't keep food down. First, the doctors told my mother that she was a nervous mother. Then they were told to try all sorts of things, ending up with Bulgarian goat's milk. God knows where they got it. <laughs> As I passed one year old, I got sicker. They took me to Duke, no help. They took me to the hospital in Columbia where everything was tried. Finally, they put my tiny, scrawny body on a pillow with no clothes on as I was too frail to wear anything rubbing the bones and told my parents to take me home to die. This is when they heard of Dr. Smith's clinic for sick children in Saluda. They took me to Saluda. Dr. Smith said, out with the nurse, out with the Bulgarian goat milk. He put me on Coca-Cola and bananas. <laughs> I flourished. The final diagnosis was colitis, but who knows what I'd had all those months. I was 15 months old when I recovered and had to learn to walk all over again. After that, we went to Saluda every summer for what I suppose was a wellness check. As my sister and brother were born, we all went. We would stay in a cabin as a family. All children under a certain age ate in the children's dining room, which was an octagonal or circular building. When we reached a certain age, we could eat with the grown-ups in the dining room. One year, about 30 years ago, the United Fruit Company wrote to my family to ask permission to use my case study in a promotion for their bananas. <laughs> <laughs> Of course my father gave permission. To this day, older people in my hometown will say, you're the baby that was so sick. And we all advocate Coca-Cola and bananas. <laughs> so. I got a letter um, from this lady. Uh, she had seen my picture in the paper. They did a, a Mother's Day uh, article about uh, Papa and, and, and educating mothers. Uh, and so she wrote me this letter. She said, Dear Ms. Blackshear, um, his, uh, her uncle in Spartanburg had sent the article to her. Uh, he said, her, His oldest sister, my mother, Nell Waldrop Jetton, was a registered nurse and worked at the baby hospital in Saluda for a short while. In the mid-1930s, she died this past year at the age of 102, seven months, and 13 days. <laughs> Until the end, she was active and her mind was sharp. Uh, she had many memories of the time she, uh, she spent in Saluda and of your grandfather, Dr. Smith. I think it was one of the happiest times of her career as a nurse. It was amazing to me that uh, she could tell the stories and even remember the names of some of the babies. Some of the stories were of success and others were very sad. But I know, I know if all the nurses were like my mother, those babies were truly loved in their care. I am only writing to tell you that there are still people who know of Dr. Smith and the wonderful work he did there in Saluda. Wow. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.